Australia is a vacation destination of which nothing is ensured except adventure, and while it's home to some of the world's most beautiful terrain and oceans, it is also unforgiving in the vastness of its landscape. Byron Bay, located in the state of New South Wales, Australia, is a prime confluence of adventure and spiritual awakening, with just a little pretentiousness thrown in with the picturesque landscape. Byron Bay is a popular tourist destination for those bold and in the know, and is home to a robust nightlife. But those who have visited say that it also has a reputation for being a bit ostentatious in its rugged and lost coast aesthetic. Generally, visitors to the area say most locals are friendly to those passing through, but they also say that some longtime residents can be wary of the constant influx of generally young and unfamiliar faces. Boasting nearly 2 million visitors a year, this relatively tiny town is unique in that it has a larger amount of visitors annually than it does actual citizens. One of those visitors was 18-year-old Theo Hayes of Belgium. He had spent the majority of the previous year traveling in and around Australia. Initially, Theo was torn between attending college, like many of his peers, and taking a gap year to travel. But ultimately, he decided that studying engineering at university could be put off a year, as adventure waits for no one. He would soon find, though, that misadventure is just as impatient and fickle a creature, as his gap year would soon end in grim uncertainty for both friends and family. Theo enjoyed his trip immensely, according to sources close to him. He spent a great deal of time with his cousin, Lisa Hayes, who fondly recalled how Theo was unique in his perspective on a gap year. She recalls that while other high school grads were spending their first year of freedom using recreational drugs and drinking in excess, Theo was much more deliberate in his seeking out of spiritual fulfillment through nature. Friends who knew him both in Australia and back at home in Belgium state that Theo was the type to actually care about having a real conversation and strived to form connections with those everywhere he went. His cousin also recalls his knack for planning and keeping organized. Theo was seen as one of the more responsible of his age group. He was close to his family overseas and spoke with his mom multiple times a week without fail. The 18-year-old arrived in Byron Bay on Wednesday, May 29th of 2019. His unofficial itinerary consisted of him using his remaining vacation time just hanging around the town. He was not tied to any particular activity as long as he was able to make it to his Greyhound bus, which would pick him up on June 3rd in order for him to go back to the Sydney-Melbourne area. He then planned on flying home to Belgium to start the next leg of his journey on the way to university and then a career. Theo chose to stay at Wake Up Hostel, one of the better and more esteemed hostels in the area. Located in Belongol, it is a bit removed from the main downtown area, but still a prime location for tourists as the hostel is only a 20 minute walk from the town square. As an added attraction for tourists on a budget, Wake Up Hostel allows travelers to use their bikes to get around and the hostel also provides a free shuttle to and from town. The entire town of Byron Bay is rather condensed in its spread, and locals state that cars are not a necessity here as the entire town is accessible via walking, if you're fit enough. Theo managed to get a room to himself in the hostel, and although he roomed alone, in what friends and family lovingly recall was quite typical for him, Theo quickly made friends with some of the other backpackers there and wasted no time in getting out to the local social scene to enjoy his last days in the country that he'd called home for more than a year. 
Theo took the free shuttle bus into town on the early evening of May 31st, 2019. This would be his last night that he was ever seen. That night was a frigid one, right in the middle of Australia's winter season. It was, in fact, the coldest night on historical record for the months of May and June in Byron. Historical weather data from Cape Byron Weather Station states that the high that day was 17 degrees Celsius, which is 62 degrees Fahrenheit, but that upon sunset, the temperature dropped all the way to 9 degrees Celsius, which is only 48 degrees Fahrenheit. This low temperature would not have been expected by Theo nor his friends, as it is not usual for the area. Theo and his buddies made their way to the Great Northern Hotel to purchase some rosé wine. CCTV footage captures them making the purchase at 7.45 p.m. In the security footage later obtained by detectives, nothing unusual or amiss was seen. It seemed like it was just a normal liquor transaction made by carefree young men about to have a night out on the town. After purchasing the rosé, Theo and his new friends then went back to the hostel via the free shuttle bus and enjoyed the wine with others on the porch of the hostel. Later, Theo and some other tourists utilized the shuttle again, this time to go to a bar called Cheeky Monkeys, a well-known bar with what some locals say had a bit of a sordid reputation. As in the early 2000s, it was ranked as one of the most violent bars in Australia. While this may have been true in 2019, locals have said that the bar's reputation for mischief has changed recently, with new ownership by a chain company. Located on what is one of the two main roads in town, this bar is pretty central in its location, though it is a few blocks from the main town square. Visitors have complained that a lack of proper lighting and often very light foot traffic can make walking in town at night an eerie experience. And while the beach town of Byron would be busy in the summer season, the winter months saw less of an influx of tourists. And this night, especially due to the unusual cold, was a quiet one. Later, bartenders at Cheeky Monkeys would report that they were only at about a quarter capacity. Theo purchased two drinks from the bar, and this, accompanied by the wine that he had previously consumed, reportedly caused some sort of visible inebriation as after an only relatively short amount of time, Theo was escorted out by security guards at around 11 p.m. Witnesses say Theo was not being crass, but was unsteady on his feet. There's debate about how intoxicated Theo was, with multiple witnesses claiming he wasn't that drunk, but others saying that it was rather obvious. There are no reports of aggression from either Theo nor his friends, and it is unclear what caused him to be escorted out. But CCTV footage captures his departure from the bar. This footage would capture the last known time Theo Hayes was seen alive. Getting back to the hostel was a simple process from the bar. Locals say that if you simply followed the bright lights and neon signs, Wake Up Hostel would be relatively easy to find, even at night after a few drinks. It should have been a 20-minute walk from the bar to the hostel. However, after obtaining Theo's Google records, it was determined that Theo never went back to the hostel that night. But that seemingly wasn't for lack of trying. Theo left the bar at 11 p.m. CCTV footage shows him walking off into the low-lit sidewalks of Kingsley Street, which is a road that runs perpendicular to Johnson, the street that the bar was on. In a move that has confounded friends, family, and investigators, Theo then proceeded to take the most absurd route at sometimes worrisome speeds. Google Maps data shows that Theo, despite having a phone to tell him otherwise, walked in the opposite direction of the hostel. He went from Kingsley Street to Tennyson Street, then to the Youth Activity Center, which was a large open field. Data shows that he then walked at a very fast pace all the way to the Millen track. He may have been running, but the data is not exact. After moving rapidly through the Millen track, Theo headed to nearby Tallow Beach, but he did so in a very indirect fashion. This path would have led him through heavy brush, which investigators say would have been almost impossible to navigate at such speeds if you were not already familiar with the area. 
This is one reason why some speculate that Theo may not have been alone. His route was bizarre to both locals and family alike. Anyone with eyes could see the hostel was in the opposite direction. So where was Theo going? And was he alone or had he been walking with another person? His parents believed that he would not have left without a friend in tow because he was a social and safe person. Locals say the pitch blackness of the bush where Theo was moving through at that time of night can be discombobulating, even to those familiar with the area. So the fact that Theo made it through in such a short amount of time is rather puzzling. Another reason some suspect that Theo was not alone is that tourists simply do not go to that area. The Milne track is not grand, nor beautiful, nor is it even easily accessible. The track simply leads from Milne Street through dense and unforgiving bushland and out to the coast of Tallow's Beach. There's nothing special nor remarkable about the location. Google Maps data shows that as Theo made his way quickly out of the bushland, he headed towards Cozy Corner Beach. This was all happening while Theo was still actively messaging people. From there, cell phone records pulled by authorities show that in this time, Theo texted a few friends. His friends insist that it was him texting and not an imposter, because the messages were in French, his native tongue, and were in his style of speaking syntactically. Reports released by police state that at 12.50 a.m. that early morning, Theo sent a Facebook message to a friend regarding an upcoming U2 tour that was to happen in Australia. The last text Theo sent was to his stepsister at 12.55 a.m. The message was on WhatsApp, and police have not released the previous text messages, so the media only has access to the vague and morbidly upbeat last text. The final text sent by Theo simply said, Merci, the French word for thank you, followed by a kiss emoji. This was the last message that he would ever send to anybody that we know of. Google data pulled by police show that in this time period, Theo also viewed an unknown YouTube video. Data pulled from his Google account shows that he searched Google Maps multiple times for the route back to his backpacker hostel. But it is unknown why he made and continued to make the choice to deviate from what would have been simple directions given by the Google Maps app. Then, right before 1am, Theo went offline. Theo's cell phone signal pinged at 1.42pm the next afternoon, June 1st. This ping, which was different from internet data usage in that it is merely a connection of the cell phone talking to a local cell tower, something even non-smartphones do. Which meant at that particular time, Theo's cell phone was on, but for how long and for what purpose, nobody knows or police have not released. The tower it was connected to was the Cape Byron cell tower, which is close to Cozy Corner Beach. After this 1.42m ping, Theo's phone did not make a cellular connection ever again. In the next few days, the hostel would not report Theo missing, even after his checkout date had come and gone. While some were highly critical of this decision because it did delay the most important 48 hours of a missing person's investigation, what some media reports and many critics forget or omit is the context and location of this particular backpacker's hostel. The sheer amount of young visitors who come and go from this locale without warning gave the hostel no initial reason to worry. Drug use and alcohol use by tourists who came to rediscover their spiritual side through nature was common and therefore this type of behavior was not out of the ordinary and usually due simply to wanderlust and not misfortune. Eventually, after almost 72 hours of not hearing from him, Theo's mother notified local authorities. A missing persons investigation was started but by that time, many complained that the trail had gone cold. Investigators searched his hostel room, but found it undisturbed, with no signs of a struggle and no signs that Theo had attempted to pack up to leave. All of his suitcases, hygiene items, and passport were still where they had been left, and it seemed that he had only packed up enough to go out for a night on the town. 
An extensive search was carried out, with authorities scouring the air, land, and sea surrounding Byron Bay. The search and rescue workers used dogs, drones, helicopters, climbers, and divers to try and find Theo. On the 10th of May, Theo's parents arrived at Byron Bay and began searching alongside local volunteers. They distributed missing person flyers all over town, but despite exhaustive search efforts, no trace of Theo was found. On the 3rd of July, the police officially called off the physical search. Nearly one month after he was reported missing, volunteers continued searching for the missing 18-year-old. A few days later, on July 7th, a volunteer search group found a cap that appeared to match the one that Theo was last seen wearing in the CCTV footage obtained by police. The cap was found in the lighthouse area, where his cell phone had last pinged. Theo's family is certain it was Theo's hat that was found, but a DNA test result has yet to be released. Theo is one of over 2,600 people in Australia who are listed as long-term missing. This classification is given to those who have not been seen or heard from in three or more months. Six of those on the list vanished just a few kilometers from Byron Bay, and their mysterious disappearances have never been solved. These deaths span three decades, and while police say they do not see a connection across age, race, or gender, they cannot rule out any connections at this time, either overall or within patterns or subgroups of historical missing victims. Three weeks after Theo was last seen, a local resident of Byron was walking through Clark's Beach Dunes and came upon a large stick with an ominous message and a sinister implication. The large stick appeared to have bloodstains on it. The wife of the man who found the stick recalls that her husband was walking when he noticed the obtrusive object first, and then the strange lettering, and then the blood-like stains. She posted a picture of the stick to social media while she waited for police to come collect it. And while she says authorities did pick it up from her, they didn't treat or process the area like a crime scene, nor did they take any photographs of the surrounding area. The stick, thick in its girth and roughly 1.5 meters long, almost 5 feet, has the words, THE JUDGE, marked on it in big black letters. One end of the stick is wrapped in duct tape. No word has come on the processing of this stick, but investigators often withhold information on test results so as to exclude false confessions or so as not to impede an arrest. Soon after, a woman came forward and told police that on June 2nd, two days after Theo went missing, while driving on Pacific Highway, she saw two men on the road. One of the men, who appeared to be in his 30s, flagged her down near Coffs Harbor, 240 kilometers south of Byron Bay, at around 4.30 a.m. The other man seemed to be lying on the road as if he was unconscious or dead. However, she decided not to stop as she felt unsafe, and later she called police and uploaded a video on Facebook describing the incident. In it, she is crying as she was worried someone might have been seriously injured. The police checked the area but could not find the men. The woman would later see a news story about Theo, and she realized that the man lying on the road was wearing light-colored pants and black shoes, the same clothes that Theo had been wearing when last seen alive on CCTV footage. She told authorities, but never heard back from them. For now, Theo's father has the last word. In a tearful plea to the media while at the police station, he said, quote, I promised Theo's little brother that I would bring his brother home. Please help me keep my promise to him. If you have any information on this case, or if you recall visiting the area of Byron Bay during this time period of May 29th to June 2nd, 2019, and may have pictures, videos, or memories of these days, please contact Crime Stoppers at 1-800-333-000 or go to nsw.crimestoppers.com.au.